Hello! Welcome back to another delicious installment of Baking from Books. I'm very excited today because I am trying to make Jurassic Park dinosaur tracking cookies, obviously inspired by Jurassic Park and sequels written by Michael Crichton. Um, I'm not going to do a big introduction on this because Jurassic Park has become completely iconic in popular culture. Uh, there's even an animated show for older kids uh, where kids get stranded on the Jurassic World island and they have to survive. And it's actually very exciting. I got kind of addicted. So um, based on the cultural icon that is Jurassic Park, we have these cookies featuring dinosaur footprints um, with the idea that you can learn things about dinosaurs from their footprints. And again, this recipe is from Kitchen Overlord. Uh, they're a fantastic blog with lots of recipes that are both geeky and surprisingly classy and high-end. This recipe, I'm actually going to read directly from it. It's all credit to Kitchen Overlord, but it is an absolute masterpiece of recipe writing, so buckle in for a fantastic ride. Assisting me today to uh, make these uh, dinosaur footprint tracking cookies is my special baking helper. Uh, here he is. I call him Horace the Horned Dinosaur, and he's going to be helping us out with some footprints today, so um, keep an eye out for Horace as he helps me out through my baking today. These dinosaur tracking cookies are deliciously flavored with lemon and lavender, so the first thing you want to do is um, get some lavender. The problem with this is it can be a little bit hard to find. You might have to order it. I did find it at a local high V, but it did take a little hunting, so fair warning about that, but it's completely worth the hunt. It comes out delicious. So, you boil some water, and then you take a heaping tablespoon of lavender. It smells amazing. And I dump it into a bowl, and it says, and I quote, use the back of a spoon to crush the lavender until it's as broken as your dreams. Drown the fragments in boiling water and let the bitterness steep. Yikes. It starts off very strong. So I just take the back of a spoon and I crush the heck out of it. When you're satisfied that it's sufficiently crushed, um, I can't vouch for your dreams, but uh, that seems sufficiently crushed to me, you take just a quarter cup of boiling water and you pour it on top of the fragments getting the lavender all drowned in there so that it can steep into the water. I'm going to add a little bit more. And uh, it turns kind of swampy in atmosphere. While that's steeping, we're going to get started on the batter. So you take your trusty mixer and a half a cup of butter, which is one stick, and one cup of sugar into your mixer bowl. And in this case, the recipe says, and I quote, cream the butter and sugar together for at least five minutes or until it's as airy and fluffy as island clouds. Full of beautiful imagery. So we're just gonna let this mix for about five minutes. Full disclosure, for this next step, you can also use dried lemon peel and just lemon juice that you buy off the shelf, which is what I would normally do. But this recipe is such a great journey that I hate to uh, deviate. So, because the next step says, zest the lemon, try not to think about the fact that it looks like you're ripping flesh from either a dinosaur or a very jaundiced Edward James Olmos. While you're in the mood for a bit of torture, cut the lemon in half and squeeze out its life's blood. It's keeping up strong, absolutely fantastic. I have no problem with that. So, got myself a lemon here. We're gonna just zest it. I have not zested many lemons in my life, so I hope I'm doing this right. This is boring. That's so much fussier than I would normally uh, like to bake. But look at that. It looks all fancy. Hard to tell. Yeah, got some zest in there. Chop this lemon. Okay. 
Wouldn't say I'm in the mood for torture, but we're gonna squeeze out its life's blood anyway. Ew. Die. There we go. That made a huge mess, and I really wouldn't bother with that most of the time, um, but it did feel uh, brutal enough to really be a Jurassic Park recipe. Um, another time, definitely wouldn't do that, but that was fun. Once you've got your juice and your zest, uh, you dump it all in with the butter and the sugar. Now one caveat about this recipe, okay, if you read the instructions and the ingredients list carefully, you'll notice that it calls for two eggs, but it does not tell you when to put them in. I don't know if there just was not a funny way to write about putting eggs in and they just forgot, but uh, it doesn't tell you to put the eggs in. But most baking cookie recipes that I've found put the eggs in at this point with the butter and the sugar once it's creamed together. So I'm going to put two eggs in at this time and just hope that's right. It's come out okay in practice, so. Take two eggs. And we're gonna mix that up. Now it's time to come back to our lavender that's been sitting here steeping for a long time. And we're gonna strain it out. I did have to buy this specially. Maybe you have a better way of straining out the plant bits. I would love to hear it. We're gonna reuse this container in the interest of not having more dishes. Um, and in this strainer, you just pour it through because you do want to collect the water. The lavender water that you've made is going to be for your, used for your um, glaze icing later. So do make sure, if you want to do a glaze, to maintain the water. And I do recommend that. The glaze comes out delicious and absolutely makes a fantastic um, addition to the cookie. So, and then you save your plant bits and you take your uh, damp plant bits, as they call it, and you dump it in with the rest of your batter and mix that in. So I'm dumping in my plant bits. Right now, it's very wet and slimy batter, but we're about to add our dry ingredients. So this is very much a trust the process situation. Dry ingredients, we start with baking powder and salt. So it's gonna be a teaspoon and a half of baking powder-ish. and a half teaspoon of salt. So then we mix that up. You wanna let that mix for at least a minute, and then you start adding in your flour. This calls for two and a quarter cups. Yeah, two and a quarter cups, which I still think is a weird amount of flour to call for, but I'm sure there's a reason, and if anybody knows it, please tell me. Like most good recipes, it says to add it about a half cup at a time, um, so you don't have a flour explosion. So you just dump in a little bit. Okay, well I had a bit of a flour explosion, as you can see, but it got all mixed up. And I'm going to quote from the recipe again, because this is one of the better lines in it. Uh, finish off the dough by adding the flour. Keep mixing until it transforms from a pale sand into a stiff dough, much like the quicksand calcifying around your father-in-law. With that happy image in mind, pack the dough into a ball and hide it in the fridge for at least an hour. Full disclosure, I've never actually packed a dough into a ball before. I usually just dump it into a Tupperware or something and then stick it in the fridge to chill. Um, but I've watched enough Great British Bake Off uh, to know how it maybe should be done. So I've got my plastic wrap here, and we're going to give it a fair shake. Um, but I make no promises about how well I can do this. The dough is kind of sticky at this point, which might make it a little bit tricky to get it uh, to form into a ball without sticking to my hands. But uh, we'll see how we do. It's alive! Pack the dough my foot out. Stick the dough together-ish. Should I have used a spatula for this? Probably. Alright, well we've got something roughly ball-like. 
wrapped in very frustrating saran wrap. And we're going to knock it in the fridge and come back once it's chilled. We're back. The dough is much more solid and uh, ball-like now. It's all chilled up. It's been in the fridge for a couple of hours. And we have come to what is perhaps the most intriguing instruction on this recipe. They tell you to preheat the oven, and then they say to roll out a couple of sheets of parchment paper and roll the dough between them. I've never done it that way in my life, and in my practice I stuck to my usual methods, and I floured the counter and rolled it out on that. But this time, I decided I'm going to try and follow the direction. All right, let's see how this goes. We got it in there. You guys, the dough is literally laughing at me as the parchment paper rips into a laughing mouth as I struggle with it. Okay, well I'm going to call that close enough because that was extremely difficult. Um, I'm not going to subject you to too many shots of this next part because it's the part that gets tedious, but this is the part where you cut out the cookies using a cookie cutter um, and place them on the cookie sheet. So I've got my cookie sheet here. And I don't have a cookie cutter, so I'm going to use the top of a cup because it's about the same size as the cookie that you'd want it to be. And I've discovered that it works okay, or at least it worked okay at home. We'll see how it goes with this very frustrating parchment paper. So I just push it down through. And it leaves the size of the cookie. So. I'm going to line the cookie sheet with parchment paper and cut out my cookies. This, in my experience, involves a lot of re-rolling the dough to make um, enough cookies to use it all the way up. Okay, to be fair, I've never bothered with parchment paper before, so it's possible I did it wrong. And if you know that I did, please tell me, because as always, I welcome your advice. But I am never doing parchment paper again unless I figure out how you're supposed to do it, because look at this. absolute carnage. It stuck to the parchment paper. It didn't want to come off. And it was chilled in for several hours in the fridge, so now it's all sticky again, and that was very frustrating. So, I did manage to get some cookies out of it, but I am going to just, just imagine that this isn't a mess, and I got all the dough cut out into cookies, okay? Now, we have finally reached the best part of this recipe. That's right. It's Horace's moment to shine. Horace the Horned Dinosaur. We take our cookies over here that are on the cookie sheet ready to go in the oven, and then you take Horace's magical little feet and you push it down into the cookie almost all the way through because you want the impressions to stay. And then, theoretically, you pull him out, leaving his little footprints behind to be baked into the cookies. Please hold while we extract him from the cookie. All right, the carnage continues. I think I might have done something wrong with this batch. Now you want your oven to be at 375 degrees Fahrenheit, and you bake these cookies for 11 to 12 minutes until they have a little bit of golden browning around the edge. Um, and once they're all cooled completely, then you're ready to do the glaze, which is the just the finishing touch. Now I'm gonna show you how to make the optional glaze to go on top of the cookies. Again, I definitely recommend this because I think it really adds something to the cookie. Um, up to you, of course, it is a lot of extra sugar. So, basically, you take your lavender water from earlier. It's supposed to be about two tablespoons. We're just gonna hope that it is. Two tablespoons of lemon juice. A pinch of salt for some reason. Not sure why. And then three quarters of a cup of powdered sugar. This is the really sugary part. Now that's all that goes in there. And then you just whisk it up until it's your desired thickness, whatever that means. I don't know if that means if you whisk it a long time it would get thicker. I tend to get 
board. I tried it on the mixer once and it didn't totally seem to help. So in my experience, you whisk it until it's combined-ish. Um, it never really seems to thicken for me, but you whisk it until you're satisfied, which takes a little while, and then... Once you've got your glaze and you're satisfied with it, you take your unglazed cookies that are all baked and cooled, and you take a pastry brush, I'm hoping this is a pastry brush, it's a brush, um, that I've only used for cooking, haven't painted with this, and you paint a thin layer onto the cookies, um, filling in some of the footprints, but not so much that they're hidden. So you just take a dip in here, and then you paint it over the top of the cookie to get a nice layer in there. And in my case, I just did a thin layer over all of them in my practice batches, and then went back for another pass when I knew how much extra I had. And there you go. And that's how you get your dinosaur footprint cookies, complete with sort of a swampy um, glaze moment going on with uh, the liquid in the footprints. But they're absolutely delicious and sweet and flavorful, and the lemon and lavender really combine well to add something. And that's it. Thank you again for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this recipe as much as I did. And if you make it, of course, share your results. We definitely want to hear how it went for you and what you think and what you would do differently, what I could have done differently. Um, in the meantime, from me and from Horace the Horned Dinosaur, uh, happy reading, happy baking.